next presentation is Dr. Jenny Gibbons, the Deputy Head of York, hi Jen, the Deputy Head of York Law School at the University of York in the UK. And Dr. Gibbons is going to speak about research magpies and shiny unofficial knowledge in legal education. Hello, my name is Jenny Gibbons um, and I'm talking today about my research into research magpies and shiny unofficial knowledge in legal education, which I'm hoping at the end of this will make a bit more sense than it probably does now. Um, so um, I am the deputy head of York Law School in the UK. Um, my doctorate is in education rather than law, so I have a very strong interest in legal pedagogy and design, which is why I'm very pleased to be presenting at this conference today. Um, for those of you who don't know, York Law School is a relatively new law school at a well-established um, university. Uh, we have been open for just over 10 years um, and we have a very distinctive curriculum that is de designed around problem-based learning. Um, so the photo here shows um, our um, purpose-built um, study centre um, where all of the classrooms are designed to facilitate small group sessions who um, do all of their learning through guided discovery model problem-based learning, which I'm happy to talk about um, with anyone who's interested, but that's not the subject of my session today. Um, instead, I want to talk about a particular area of research that um, I conducted with a couple of my colleagues, um, and the details of the paper are on the bibliography at the end of these slides. Um, and the reason that we conducted this research is because, although we are big fans of um, training students into conducting independent research, we were very concerned about what they were actually doing. So one of the things that we notice when um, students submit their essays is that their referencing indicates that perhaps they aren't looking at the same kind of sources that we think they are. Um, so we just have this ongoing concern about what the students are actually doing when we ask them to conduct independent research. So my colleague, um, conducted um, recordings of a sample of 10 undergraduate students um, undertaking a research task. So the task was designed specifically for this study um, and um, the students had a whole ethical approval for this um, and knew that they were going to be recorded in this way. So effectively um, we recorded their screen um, and their narrative on how they were undertaking the research for this particular task. Um, the links to the recordings are available in the paper, so you can actually go and listen in, um, and there's kind of a, a transcript of the students talking whilst the screen shows them undertaking their research. Now, the task was one that is very typical of the kind of thing that we'd be expecting our students to do at the law school, um, and that was um, effectively finding um, the answer um, to two questions. The first, on what basis can the UK courts lawfully restrict freedom of speech? And the second, are protections for freedom of speech in the UK sufficient? Um, so an interesting and obviously topical um, issue that all of us discuss with our law students around the world. Um, and I say on this task for the first one, this is kind of a very substantive question. We'd be expecting them to look into free of expression as a human right, um, have some kind of understanding of the Human Rights Act 1998 and its impact in the UK, and also this idea of what the court's role is um, in the balancing of rights. So quite a kind of distinct task, but you know, a lot of information there um, for them to be finding. For the second one, this is more of a normative um, question um, and for this we would expect them to be engaging with the academic authority um, and because we have quite a lot of international students there'd be an element there of some kind of comparative research would be appropriate as well. So of course we have an expectation of what the students should be doing um, and in the curriculum when we're looking at freedom of speech we'd also be providing kind of structured resources and reading lists and um, um, lectures. So there'd be a lot of kind of structure there, but we are still interested in this independent research. And this um, activity um, was to try and kind of really get to grips with what they were actually doing, rather than perhaps what our expectations of them are. Um, 
so this is all set out in the paper. I'm just kind of um, giving a brief summary to this. Um, but effectively, we quite like this idea of um, seeing students as magpies, so the kind of birds that kind of just go out and find the shiny things and bring them back to their nest. I, I appreciate that's a very kind of clunky metaphor, but it, we find it quite useful to see what they're doing. Um, so this idea that they are you know, trying to use their time as efficiently as possible to find the shiny knowledge that will enable them to come back to the classroom and effectively showcase that they have found the answer to the task that has been set. However, but under this study, we realised that um, things are not quite as they seem. Um, and we were quite concerned, actually, um, particularly knowing that the students knew that we were watching what they were doing, um, in that they really didn't seem to engage with the kind of official knowledge resources in the way perhaps that we would expect them to do or that we intended them to do. So a lot of them, for example, just bypassed the... Um, the information that we have provided for them um, and um, you know they instead they they were going to kind of more unofficial sources so this idea of official knowledge and unofficial knowledge I'll come back to in a moment but the main findings for the survey is that they weren't doing what they we were expecting them to do um, and we felt that there was a bit of a tension between encouraging independent learning which is very much part of the problem-based learning model and yet when we want them to be doing that we then query and question the kind of information and the sources that they're using this kind of unofficial knowledge um, and another thing that we identified was that there was quite a difference in the time spent or the time kind of ex they, they explained to us that they would spend on the substantive versus the normative sources so they seemed relatively familiar with the fact that they would need to be looking at the legislation um, and relevant cases, for example, and even the kind of differences between the domestic courts and the European courts around this issue. Um, but for the second part of the task, this kind of, you know, is it good enough kind of question, they really didn't spend a huge amount of time on that. Um, and they didn't seem to really appreciate the value of the normative sources um, sufficiently and obviously in, a, in an academic subject like law we found that quite problematic. So just to flesh out a little bit um, this these kind of terms and this is where um, I'm moving more into my area of research rather than an explanation of our programme um, and this is these ideas of official knowledge, um, charismatic authority um, and this new idea that I've been developing and I'm, I'm interested in finding your views on, which is this idea of unofficial knowledge. Um, so in terms of official knowledge, um, this kind of builds on the work of Apple um, from the 1990s, who was looking at the school curriculum um, and Bernstein as well, who also had an interest in, you know, what does the school curriculum, how, how do we kind of classify the knowledge um, and frame the knowledge. So what, what knowledge is relevant to different disciplines and how do students understand that knowledge in the way that they do things? And I've been interested in this quite a long time. This is the basis of my PhD, is thinking what some of these ideas mean for the law school curriculum. Um, so in terms of official knowledge and how it relates to law, things like reading lists, signposting cases, instruction-led activities, lecture sites and so on, or classify to the students what we believe is the knowledge that is relevant to the discipline. And also the way that we present that, um, and particularly around kind of assessments, we kind of frame for them what knowledge we regard as important, and we want them to effectively showing back to us. Um, and so there's a kind of um, authority around the law school that gives legitimacy to the knowledge that we present as being um, the curriculum. Um, I'm kind of going over a huge amount of work um, in this kind of brief summary, but essentially um, these ideas of official knowledge are quite well established. And in law, they very much link to, for example, the qualified law degree, the kind of things that the professional regulators tell us that we should be telling our students. The concept of charismatic authority is one that you may be familiar with. Um, And it's the concept of leadership.
involves a type of organisation or a type of leadership in which authority derives from the charisma of the leader. Um, and this stands in contrast to two other types of authority being legal authority and traditional authority. Um, and just to let you know, I took that definition cut and paste from Wikipedia. And my issue here is that's exactly what the students do, that Wikipedia and Google sources have themselves charismatic authority and the students use their research to find these kind of shiny things that are very easily accessible and that they can bring back and kind of show that it has charismatic authority. So this third element of unofficial knowledge is a concept that I've been developing in my work. Um, and it's effectively building on this idea of, you know, can we regard um, Google as having charismatic authority? And what does that actually mean for the way that we classify and frame the knowledge in our curriculum? So this idea of weakly classified information um, has an impact on what the students actually learn and what their perception of law actually is. And following on from our study, um, that is something that we find quite problematic. So in the task that we set them relating to freedom of speech, if they had just used online search engines to find their answers, what answers would they be finding? Um, and, you know, when I did this for myself, just using kind of random search terms or even what the students do, which is just take the whole question and put it in the search bar, what do they actually find out? Um, and it was quite interesting in different um, search engines. Um, it, it's very American focused. Well, that's one thing. So when we're kind of looking at the UK Constitution and UK human rights, you have to kind of wade through a lot of American sources. Um, but also, of course, the algorithms that you have created on your own computer will also dictate the kind of information that you find. And I think all of those are problematic elements, which leads me on to where I want to bring you into this debate um, on this idea of discussion points, because this is something that I intend to do additional research on. And I really want kind of <laughs> validation as to whether this is an area that needs research and some ideas about how to conduct it. So in terms of the, the last five minutes of this um, presentation, this session, um, I'd really like to kind of get your ideas on these two discussion points. So first of all, thinking about the power bases, um, what are the influences that actually determine what unofficial knowledge looks like? Um, and does that create echo chambers? Does, will that actually um, change what people think some of these key legal concepts and principles mean? Um, and, you know, what, what impact does that have on us in the institution? Um, and separate, secondly, you know, is this something that needs greater theoretical underpinning? Um, is there scope for this to kind of join these ideas of charismatic authority um, with this idea of official and unofficial knowledge? Um, and, you know, I can see that it has resonance in law, um, but what does that mean for other disciplines? Um, and also kind of law as taught in other areas. So I'm going to stop talking at this point, and I'm hoping that um, this will be the point that people can join me in these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And uh, well, we do have, uh, so there's a great presentation, of course, and we've got one question from uh, George from the Access to Justice group, who spoke earlier in the afternoon. And George, uh, George asks, if students are using charismatic information anyway, would you encourage students to contribute to this type of information through editing wiki pages, for example? Hi, um, I find that a very um, disconcerting thing of watching my own presentation. I think that's the first time I've done that. So that, that was rather discombobulating. Um, that's a really interesting point about this, um, bringing, picking up this charismatic authority, charismatic information point, and it links up with some of the former presentations about things like um, the Wiki Juris project and kind of open access, open curated materials. And I think, I think they are very useful. However, I do think that we need to be thinking about the power bases of the curation. Who is responsible for putting the boundaries around that knowledge? Um, so I absolutely think that the student voice should be in there, um, but what, who, who ultimately gets to decide on that? Um, and who has the legitimate authority to be that curator, um, to be the person who is setting the boundaries on knowledge. And I'm finding the kind of Google 
you know, at the moment it is Google or the kind of, the, you know, the people in Google who have these kind of abilities to kind of do it, but they're doing it in a very light touch way. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't have the answer to that. And I think it's really important to have this student as producer, um, but it does lead to these questions about what does that actually mean for the knowledge itself? I mean, just, I mean, I've got two questions, just to follow up. I mean, presumably the only way you could know You'd have to ask Google, I guess, would you? About how? You know. Well, this is a, Google itself is a very kind of opaque organization. You know, who, how, how do we know where they draw the line as to what is okay and what is not? And my concern is there's a huge amount of misinformation, bad scholarship, bad knowledge on the internet. And for a young, you know, student, who is very familiar with just kind of looking for the answer on the internet. And I think for school education, that's, you know, that's an efficient way to spend their time. But once we get into what we're doing, which was we're trying to create critical thinkers and um, people who are going to generate new knowledge, if the foundational base that everyone is working on is so unstable, what does that actually mean for, for future knowledge? Um, so, so can we trust Google to be the people to do that. I, I haven't got an alternative, but I'm just saying that we need to be kind of mindful of the kind of very unstable foundation of knowledge that is being used in this way. Thank you. And then Natasha comments that she considers unofficial knowledge as being information from unverified resources. So she thinks there's a danger of echoing inaccurate information. I suppose the idea is, you know, student finds this inaccurate information, uses it as a kind of feedback loop. I guess that's the idea, Natasha. Um, and uh, the question, Natasha's question is, is it so much about char the charismatic nature of Google, or is it just more about convenience and speed of using Google or Wikipedia? Um, picking up on that kind of verified and unverified sources, um, I think it also goes then to whether we believe that a verified source is therefore the truth. Um, and in the current debate that's happening around the world, you know, there's a lot about whose truth are we talking about here. Um, my subject that I teach the most is um, I teach constitutional law and I teach human rights law. And they are two kind of subject areas where the established textbooks tell a particular version of the historical truth. And the conversations I have with the students is, well, there's another version of truth. And the, the vo some of the voices haven't been heard in the official versions of knowledge. So I do think there's a space for unofficial knowledge to effectively challenge the official knowledge and say, actually, what you're saying is just one version of the truth. And so if we make that distinction between the textbooks being right and Google being wrong, I think that's too simplistic. Because actually the textbooks themselves are a convenient version of a simplified truth that tells a particular voice in a particular narrative. Um, and for you know, UK constitutional law, that has some very dodgy, you know, questionable sources that I think are now very much part of, of the debate. So I think the students should be involved in that debate. Um, but I just, you know, it goes back to this power and curation. Who, who, you know, who, who can be trusted to, to you know, draw the lines between what should be taught and what shouldn't be taught. I think that ties what you've just said, ties into the question from my colleague, Professor Saravi Chopra, who says that research is increasingly highlighting the hierarchies, gender, race, class, encoded into widely used technologies. Perhaps we need to be reflecting on this critically in legal research teaching in year one rather than simply introducing students to different tools and databases. I, I absolutely agree. And I think um, in legal education, um, doctrinal research has a very strong presence throughout the curriculum. Um, whereas, you know, when we're talking about legal research, that is just one version of research. And it usually takes till later on in the syllabus that students learn about, say, critical research methods or feminist or socio-legal. But actually, if you're using a different research method, you find a different version of the truth. So, you know, I, absolutely, we need to be teaching doctrinal 
research. So, you know, this is how you find the statute. This is how you look at a case. This is how you analyze a case. But if you're analyzing a case from kind of 30, 40, 50 years ago, I don't think you should ever discount the culture that was, you know, influencing the judges. So I don't think that can be held as a truth. It's, you know, it is a point in time when we're looking at case law. And if you actually introduce them to kind of critical method, feminist method, then those kind of critical voices come into their heads when they are doing doctrinal case analysis. And I mean, colleagues and I may disagree on this, but you know, I, I think that is as important a discussion as kind of looking at what one judge said versus what another judge said, when both of those judges are dead and both of those judges came from a, partic a particular you know, demographic um, at a particular time. So, you know, all of that, I think we need to be discussing more about, about what doctrinal research means and bringing in different research methods um, as part of legal research training. Thanks, Jed. A, co a comment and then two, and then two more questions. Or, so one comment, first of all, from George Shinlock Ho from the Eight Access Justice Group earlier. He just comments that it's inevitable that students who are sort of short on time um, and under pressure have got to rely on these uh, unofficial sites. Um, then from Heidi, Heidi says, I'm an academic librarian with a background in law and the current, co the current conversation has a lot of overlap with the threshold concept in informa information literacy of authority as constructed and, con and contextual. Yes, I, I am familiar with the threshold concept um, idea and I think it's really valid and important. Um, I'd have to dig around in my head to make the connections with what I was doing here, but I'm perfectly... The threshold concept <laughs> of authority, I think, is, is the... Yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I would be really interested in developing that as a kind of overlapping um, idea for study in the future with anyone who's interested. Uh, Angel uh, from Clear says, who spoke earlier, Angel says she completely agrees with you that the issue of whose truth it is and student autonomy in deciding some part of the course content can highly enhance student engagement and ownership during the knowledge creation process. Yes, and I, I think we, 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 it's a courtesy to our student body to recognise that they have a different truth. And, you know, when we have international students coming to the UK from all over the world, um, even the reason why they're speaking English and they're coming to the UK is linked with this idea of a version of the truth. Um, and so I think we need to recognize that those voices are absolutely valid and, and facilitate the ability to be critical about when we are um, looking at what the law actually is and what the law states. So, you know, I, I, I think there is something static there, you know, obviously official knowledge, there are, there's many, many, many things that are true and valid. And obviously the law as it currently is, it has to be seen as static however as soon as you get into the law as you know as, as a historical narrative you get into different versions and also if you see the law as a comparative and you know for example human rights is an area we have to be looking at the law as it applies in different countries and then you get further away from this version of official knowledge and so we then need to be thinking about well if, if we're looking for counter to that kind of critique of that where, where, how valid is that information? You know, who is that authority? Um, and I completely support students in looking at information from NGOs and from, um, you know, not you don't. It doesn't always have to be a, a kind of twice peer-reviewed article for it to be a valid source of information. But then it all starts to get a bit weaker and whatever. And we we need to we start questioning where or where this authority comes from. Jen, I'm gonna, there's a comment. Uh, I'll just pass on from um, Jasper Kaur, um, and I think the comment is that about the validity and authority of unofficial knowledge, and his point is that this knowledge might help in, in context, context, contextualizing the research as a background. So I think he's saying it's kind of a preparation, unofficial knowledge as a preparation for engaging with official knowledge. Uh, and so some kind of hierarchy of reliable resources Jen, and thank you, Jasper.